And with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Gita, who's moderating the session, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to this one. So thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks, Steve, and hello, everyone. My name's Gita Pariha. I'm going to be the moderator of this session on geoengineering and the law, which is being hosted by the Climate Justice Foundation, the Honig World Foundation, and CL. So the session is going to be last for about an hour, 15 minutes, so it will be finished by uh, 4.15 UK time, 5.15 Geneva time, and that's as far as I'm going to go with time zones <laughs> before I get very confused. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction to the topic and our speakers, um, then we'll be hearing from the speakers that we have, our three speakers, for about half an hour or so um, before we open up the floor for questions. Um, and then just uh, before the end, about five past or ten past four, I'll return back to them for some closing reflections. So you're all here um, to hear about the topic of geoengineering. Um, geoengineering doesn't have a formal definition, but in very broad terms, um, it refers to a deliberate intervention in the Earth's climate system with the aim of counteracting climate change. And, in, and again, very broadly speaking, there are two sorts of ways in which this is done. There are technologies that aim to pull greenhouse gases um, out of the atmosphere and they're called carbon dioxide removal or CDR, and they're technologies that aim to reflect more sunlight back into space, and those are known as solar radiation management or SRM. Um, in recent years, there have been an increasing number of policies and proposals and research projects about the use, um, use of geoengineering technologies, and that's um, driven by the increasing urgency of the need to take action on climate change and the, the sense that not enough is being done in terms of emissions reductions. But there are also a number of counter arguments against their use as we'll see, and they, they include the environmental and human rights impacts, and also the risk that they lock in dependency on fossil fuels um, and detract attention away from emissions reductions, um, the need for emissions reductions. In legal terms, this is a very uh, complex area. And um, as a result, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, HBF, commissioned a public opinion from Matrix, which is a leading law chambers in the UK. And um, they commissioned it from two barristers, Kate Cook, who we have on our panel, and Philippe Sands QC. So this was, um, Kate will be presenting on, a, on the joint opinion, key aspects of the opinion that they produced. And the aim of this event is really to discuss the, the potential ramifications of that um, and the implications of these technologies on the ground. So we'll be starting off with Kate, who co-authored the opinion, as I, as I mentioned. And Kate will, um, is a specialist environmental and human rights lawyer who's appeared before the International Court of Justice on cases that relate to environment and genocide. Her recent work includes advising states, NGOs, and international organizations on the climate emergency. She regularly lectures and publishes on environmental issues, including the best available science standard and the Paris Agreement. Once we've heard from Kate, we'll be hearing from um, Carol, who, as I say, will be discussing the potential implications of the opinion um, and potentially areas of legal challenge. Carol is president of the Center for International Environmental Law, CL, which is a non-profit organization that uses the power of law to protect the environment, promote human rights, and ensure a just and sustainable society. He is a recognized international environmental law and climate litigation expert and a co-author of CL's Fuel to the Fire report, which looks at fossil fuel industry involvement in geoengineering, as well as a report on why carbon capture is not a climate solution. Carol serves on the Board of Trustees for the Climate Accountability Institute and on the Steering Committee for the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And then finally, we'll be looking at the impacts of geoengineering on the ground through hearing from Asa Larsen Blind. And Asa has been a member of the Sami Council since 2008 and was elected president in the period 2017 to 2019. She is part of a reindeer herding family and holds a master's degree in human resources management and development. She was also the Sami Council board member of the Indigenous People Secretariat and the first female chair of the National Association of Sami in Sweden, as well as being active in a number of other Sami organizations. 
So I'm sure that you'll agree that this is bound to be a fascinating discussion with our panelists and I'll be handing over to them shortly. The only other thing I wanted to say is I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions um, as you hear from our panelists, but please could you save them for the end of the discussions because if you put them into the chat now they will get lost and you may find that they change um, in the course of hearing to people, hearing from people or other. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to Kate to begin our discussion. Kate, over to you. Thank you very much, Geeta. Just bear with me while I put up these slides. Um, yes, it works. That's always a relief. Um, just, just one quick uh, caveat, as is always the case with UK barristers, the opinion that was commissioned is, is from myself and Philippe Sands QC. It's not a matrix chamber's opinion. Our opinions are always in our individual capacities. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking on this topic this afternoon. Um, it's a complex and very interesting area. What I'm going to do, I obviously can't cover everything in, in the short space of time that we have, I'm going to focus on a few key themes um, that emerged when we, when we put together the opinion and a number of regimes that have been particularly active in looking at geoengineering. So I think the first thing to say is that although there's no comprehensive um, regime that governs geoengineering under international law, that doesn't mean that international law doesn't already um, set constraints or restrictions on the development and deployment of geoengineering, as we will see. So just to start with the context for considering these legal constraints on geoengineering, as Gita has already outlined, clearly there is recognition that there is the potential for harm across the range of these technologies, which obviously varies according to which geoengineering technology you're talking about. But broadly speaking, um, they may pose risks to physical, uh, physical impacts on the environment uh, and or on human health. And there are also social and economic impacts, which may be directly in relation to land use um, of people affected by their deployment. And in particular, which is what one of the things I'm going to focus on in my presentation, there is the impact on the international response to the climate emergency. What is the impact of promoting geoengineering on um, the international effort to uh, achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement use and, and the framework that is set under that agreement and under the convention itself. One of the key risks in that respect is the risk of overshoot. That's the risk of exceeding the temperature goals um, with a view perhaps to then trying to come back down to meet those goals. But as has been highlighted by the IPCC and many others, overshoot carries its own distinct risks. Um, in a CBD technical paper in 2016, it was pointed out that any overshoot of the temperature goals is likely to have additional environmental consequences that may not be reversible on decadal to centennial time scales. And clearly, if there are species extinctions involved, those are irreversible. So any action involving geoengineering which delays or defers emissions reductions and the move away from fossil fuels risks oversheet, overshoot, and that brings its own set of potentially irreversible impacts. Um, this is an area of, of some degree of scientific uncertainty. Again, that's clear from the IPCC reports, uh, particularly the fifth assessment report and the, and the 1.5 report. Um, and that brings obviously precaution into play. And finally, and others are going to address this, there appears to be a lack of transparency and public engagement and accountability in relation to the operation of field trials. And that brings into play human rights law, as well as principles that are enshrined under other MEAs, including the Paris Agreement itself. So just looking at what's, um, what's been done uh, in relation to these issues under other regimes, uh, and there are many, there are more than, than I've been able to address here, but I'm going to focus on uh, primarily on the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD. Uh, a series of decisions have been adopted by the parties, including decision 1033, which I'll come back to in a moment. There's also been extensive and important discussion under the London Convention uh, and its protocol in relation to ocean fertilization. 
um, dating back to, to 2008, a series of resolutions have been adopted. Uh, you can see there an extract from um, the 2008 resolution where the parties agreed that given the present state of knowledge, ocean fertilization activities other than legitimate scientific research should not be allowed. And that approach has been reaffirmed subsequently uh, in 2010 and 2013. A resolution has been adopted to amend the convention and the protocol to, to make express provision for this and to set uh, an assessment framework for scientific research that hasn't yet come into force, but parties have reaffirmed that this basic position re uh, remains in play. And finally, um, ongo there's ongoing consideration of the use of stratospheric aerosols under the Montreal Protocol, um, mainly under the scientific bodies uh, under that regime, and a further scientific report is expected to, presented, to be presented to the parties in 2022. So just coming back to the CBD decision, you see the paragraph 8W, which is the key paragraph of that decision, which issued guidance to the parties. Uh, you see it refers to an earlier decision on ocean fertilization, which was the first area that was considered. But then this decision broadens that out and says parties have agreed that in the absence of a science-based and effective control mechanism for geoengineering, and in accordance with precaution in Article 14, no climate related geoengineering activities that may affect biodiversity take place until there's an adequate scientific basis on which to justify those activities and appropriate consideration of the associated risks. So that's the general position, often referred to by commentators as a de facto moratorium on geoengineering under the CBD. And obviously, the qualification may affect biodiversity is very broad. I, I would imagine it uh, is relevant to, to all of the technologies or the vast majority of geoengineering technologies that have been put forward. There is a heavily, heavily qualified exception for small scale scientific research studies. Uh, and I will come back to that in a moment to look at the conditions around that. But I think it's important to say that this decision, which has been reaffirmed in a subsequent decision 1120, um, clearly represents a precautionary approach, but also, and there's a relationship between the two, I would argue, uh, it's an approach which places the onus for justification very squarely on those uh, advocating these technologies to justify them and to show why they, uh, the risks could be justified in, in view of the, the goals that they uh, purport to pursue. So in terms of field trials, um, these are the list of, of qualifications. Small scale, what does that mean? Obviously, that might need to be discussed in different uh, environmental fora. What does it mean in the marine environment or in the atmosphere? Uh, it's very hard to know what, how you could achieve a small scale marine experiment, for example. The reference to Article 3 um, indicates that uh, the controlled setting must remove the risk that activity will cause harm to the environment of other states or areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. Again, that's an exacting standard. The research study must have a clear research objective and be justified by the need to gather specific data. What does that imply? Well, if there was, if it appears that any field trial is primarily based on a desire to commercialize the technology, that would not appear to meet these requirements. And perhaps even more importantly, if there's any evidence that computer modeling, for example, would be an alternative or even more effective way of meeting the research objective. Again, a proposed field trial would not appear to meet the conditions laid down in decision 1033. So turning to customary international law, um, clearly this is relevant in this area where you have these untested uh, technologies which may carry grave risks. Um, the principle of prevention is clearly relevant and in fact is referred to, customary international law is referred to in a subsequent CBD decision. Precaution is clearly relevant. Um, both the CBD decisions and those under the London Convention refer to precaution or utmost caution. Um, when we considered this issue, we noted that proposed solutions to the risks posed by climate change, but which themselves imply large and uncertain environmental risks, clearly require, at the very least, a precautionary approach. And there are two major concerns. The uncertainty is the, as to the impacts of geoengineering on complex planetary systems, 
and as I said earlier, the irreversibility of some of those impacts. Um, it's notable that SRM measures are not included in any of the IPCC assessed pathways, uh, and that the IPCC has also indicated that there are uncertainties as to the potential contribution that CDR, CDR measures might make to achieving climate goals, and that there are concerns about adverse side effects. If you read the agenda court decisions, both uh, the, the appellate and the, and the higher level decision, the courts in those cases expressed skepticism about CDR in even stronger terms than the IPCC had in its fifth assessment report. So coming back to the sort of heart of the matter, the reason for even considering these technologies is to address the risks of climate change. That is the argument that is put forward by advocates of geoengineering. So it's important to come back to the regime that the international community has already adopted to address that threat, the, the convention and now the Paris Agreement. The international temperature goals that would prevent dangerous climate change, at least to a, to a degree, are to be achieved through the stabilization of emissions. That's clear in the regime. And that entails mitigation, reduction of emissions, as is set out in more detail in the Paris Agreement. The mitigation frame, framework, as parties recognized when they adopted the Paris Agreement, require deep cuts in emissions, and as then set out in Article 4, peaking as soon as possible with rapid reductions thereafter. These geoengineering technologies do not do that. They are not mitigation measures in that sense. Uh, they are not designed to reduce emissions. They are designed to extract carbon that's already in the atmosphere or to deflect uh, energy coming from the sun. That's a different approach. It's not the approach that is uh, um, encompassed in the Paris Agreement, we would argue. It's clear that we have a problem, as UNEP reports have indicated in the series of emissions and now production gap reports, the international community is not on track to meet the international goals. Despite progress in some areas, we are still doing the wrong things. And in particular, we are still uh, look to uh, exploit uh, fossil fuel reserves that are inconsistent with those temperature goals. So given that problem, what is the answer? Is it geoengineering or is it simply doing what parties have already agreed to do under the Paris Agreement? And that is to reduce emissions. Um, one key area is to avoid locking in fossil fuels by promoting investment in new reserves. And that's something I'll come back to. But the question is, does developing techniques, geoengineering technologies, which themselves pose serious risks uh, and which may undermine those global goals by encouraging overshoot or lock-in, constitute a breach of good faith, the good faith duty to cooperate under Paris? And we concluded in our opinion that the, uh, there is an argument that it does. Um, I'll just um, briefly, yes, um, just reinforce the point that the Paris Agreement is the binding agreed international framework to address risks of climate change. Uh, and other bodies have also flagged up that mitigation should be the focus. So the parties to the London Convention in their 2013 resolution emphasized that ocean fertilization and other marine geoengineering should not be considered as a substitute for mitigation. And I think that that message is, is true across all other sectors. And the focus in Paris is on preserving sinks and reservoirs uh, addressing adaptation while respecting human rights and acting on the basis of best available science. Again, the IPCC excludes SRM from the definition of adaptation. Another key area is making a goal of the Paris Agreement is to make finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions. Deploying investment in response to climate change in geoengineering does not meet that goal, it is not uh, consistent with a pathway towards low emissions. That goal should be towards transitioning away from fossil fuels and towards renewables, as well as taking other measures. So the key elements that emerge are the duty not to cause harm, acting on the basis of precaution, compliance with human rights and treaty requirements for transparency and public participation, and these are reflected in the Paris Agreement itself in Istanbul and in Articles 7, 12 and 13. Uh, and in particular, in relation to human rights law, looking at the provision for free prior informed consent 
but even field trials that may have an impact on the lands or resources of indigenous peoples and other communities. And also the importance of impact assessment, specific and uh, peer reviewed impact assessment as a prerequisite for considering action which may have impacts on others. Um, so in conclusion, uh, when we drew up the opinion, we looked at actions that we thought would be open to challenge, potentially legal by states or others, and in particular states. So for example, if action by states increases the risk of overshoot um, by uh, where states facilitate the lock-in of fossil fuels through investment, for example, on the basis that this can be mitigated in the future through geoengineering, we said that there was a good argument that that was a breach of good faith efforts to cooperate to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And similarly, you see there are other areas Did we just lose Kate? I think we have just lost Kate, unfortunately. So I'm sure she'll be trying to rejoin right now. Just give her few moments. I, I, she was in her concluding phases of, of what she was saying, but always um, better to try and finish before we move on to our next speaker. In the meantime, the, there was a, I can see that there's a question in the chat about the opinion that um, Kate is a, presenting to. Um, that opinion was, I was explaining at the beginning, beginning for those who, who didn't join right at the beginning, was commissioned by the Heinrich Boll Foundation uh, as a public opinion. So it, it's available to share, um, but it's not, it's not publicly on a website, but uh, Lily is, is happy to share the opinion with, with people who are interested to see it. In fact, she's just put a, a link to it into the chat. Hopefully, Kate will join us soon. Um, we'll give it a few more minutes. And if not, we may, we may have to move on to Carol um, to begin his presentation. As I think Kate had done the job of setting the broad framework, but it would, of course, be very helpful to hear. Geo engineering check later, Peter. Sorry, one of our um, attendees. Thank you. Oh, there she is. Great. Okay. Hopefully she will be able to rejoin now. And see some questions coming in. It would be helpful if we, or it, well, if, if you could frame your comments as questions, please, then we can, we can pose them to our speakers. If there are, if there are questions, please do um, frame them as such, but, as, as I said at the beginning, it would be helpful if you were to wait till the end because you may find that your questions change or are answered or other things happen in the meantime while you're hearing the presentation. So, it look, oh, we have Asa with us, which is wonderful because I know she was having technical problems earlier, so that's great. Um, do we have Kate back with us, Kate? I did see that she'd rejoined. Okay, 
which I think she's trying again. Let's see if that works. Uh, so we were just having Kate's presentation, but she encountered some technical di difficulties right at the very end, and she is trying to rejoin the room, though I don't think she's been six. Oh, actually, Kat, Kate, are you, can you hear us? Uh, I can see her as a participant, but I can't see that she's got her access to her microphone. But in the meantime, I am just going to read out the comment from Pali Vincent from No, which is Friends of the Earth Denmark. We have the problem that while SRM is considered far out, CCS and especially BEX is included in many of the more stringent scenarios in the IPCC reports. And perhaps that's something that will be coming up in, in Carol's presentation um, or can be addressed in the questions. In, I think we've... Yep, Carol is saying he will speak to that. Okay, I think that perhaps we should move on to Carol um, so as not to, so as to keep with the flow of um, the presentations and then we can perhaps come back to Kate um, who will hopefully be able to rejoin us um, towards the end of the presentation. So if I can now give the um, floor to Carol, please. Thank, thanks, Gita. And I actually want to begin with Pali's question <clears throat> because I think it's a good entry point to what what we're seeing and why the opinion from from Kate and Philippe is so valuable right now. I think one of the things that we have seen is that, as as Pali notes, you know, in many of the models that are being put forward, there is a really heavy reliance on some forms of geoengineering, particularly particularly BEX, but not exclusively BEX. Um, when you look at the IPCC's special report on uh, 1.5 degrees C, however, there is one of the four scenarios that they lay out. Um, that doesn't rely on CCS and expressly doesn't rely on BEX. It does rely on other forms of afforestation and reforestation, but it's not contingent on technological CDR or other forms of geoengineering. And obviously in the SR 1.5 report, the, the IPCC expressly disclaimed um, you know, any, any, any role in its analysis for solar radiation modification, solar radiation management. I mentioned that, however, because in the wake of the 1.5C report, and we're seeing it again in the wake of the IPCC's Working Group 1 report, um, we saw many proponents of geoengineering you know, using the IPCC report to essentially argue that there is no pathway to, to achieving 1.5C without the reliance on CDR. And in fact, that is not what the IPCC said. One of the things that CL did in the wake of the 1.5 degree report is we went through the entirety of the 1.5 um, report, including all of its annexes, and looked at every single reference to CCS, to BEX, and to other forms of CDR. And notwithstanding the common characterization of that in the media, what, what we found was that by and large, the, the IPCC's treatment of these technologies was at best ambivalent and in its fairest assessment, peppered with repeated warnings that there's heavy reliance on these technologies in national, in NDCs, in models and pathways, and yet they are unproven and they carry profound risks. We see something really similar in the wake of in the wake of the release of the Working Group One report, where we've seen, you know, in the media, many people characterizing the Working Group One report as again highlighting that 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 1.5 degrees C is not possible without without reliance on CDR, and yet when you actually work through the one point, the working group one report, what you find in the in the details in the chapters is again a lot of tautology. 
that, that the IPCC effectively says, if CDR works, if CDR actually removes a large amount of carbon at scale, then yes, it will be an important part of a solution to the climate crisis. But that if is the critical part of the analysis. And I, I mentioned that because it speaks to what we are seeing in these spaces that 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 geoengineering which had been which had been you know for many years marginalized to the fringes of the geoengineer of the climate debate is moving more and more aggressively not only into the public discourse but into policy proposals we see this with with proposals for large scale funding of geoengineering research by the US government we see it you know particularly troublingly with a, a two year you know a two year effort within the international organization for standardization to adopt a voluntary system of 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 marketable credits for, for solar radiation management under the guise of radiative forcing. Um, and again, largely out of the public sight. And then more recently, what we're seeing is that, you know, these policy proposals are now moving rapidly into the, the, the sphere of, of actual experimentation and implementation. That, that's, you know, that's in the, the, the experiment, the experiment with Scopex and the proposed uh, Scopex experiment in Sweden um, this past summer is emblematic of that, and uh, also we'll, we'll we'll speak to that in more detail. But I'll note that you know one of the important things about that test is it moved forward, notwithstanding the fact that it was presented as a model for how public consultation and governance would be done on tests of this kind. It moved forward without any consultation with the, the indigenous peoples whose territory the experiment would take place over. Um, and this is a recurring theme that we are seeing in the movement towards these experiments, is a heavy focus on the global south and a heavy focus on ex and citing experiments on or over indigenous territories. We're seeing that again with the Arctic ice project in the you know in the US and Canada. And that that brings me to you know why the analysis from from Kate and Philippe is really critically important right now. And, and that is because many advocates for geoengineering are arguing that you know we should be focused on developing a long-term governance framework for geoengineering. And in the meantime, arguing that existing mechanisms for addressing, uh, addressing these issues are inadequate. But the fact that the existing mechanisms are inadequate does not mean that they don't exist. And I think what you see in Kate's analysis is that there are actually a number of legal tools and quasi-legal tools that we have at our disposal to address these, these accelerating policy proposals in address the debate and, and to engage on specific projects. And I think, you know, uh, I mean, Kate focused her analysis on, on the CBD, which is obviously really important. The London Protocol, there's the, 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 the London Dumping Convention. There's also, you know, there's also the ongoing discussion within the Montreal Protocol about how it will apply to these technologies. But much more immediately relevant are the Aarhus Convention and the Eskazu Convention um, that speak to standards of democratic inclusion, access to information, the UNDREP and the standards it establishes for, for free prior and informed consent for affected communities. And finally, and fundamentally, the entire domain of human rights law. And I think this is, this is an area of the law that is really untapped and unexplored in the context of these debates. And it is a critically important one. Um, and the failures of FPIC in the SCOPEX process speak to why it's so important. It's, it's really important to recognize that one of the challenges that, that any geoengineering deployment and even geoengineering experimentation is going to face is the profound disconnect 
between commitments to, to seek free prior and informed consent and the actual realities of, of securing that consent in a context in which the, the changes that are being affected by geoengineering testing and deployment may be telegraphed across thousands of miles and indeed across entire hemispheres, which means lo locating you know, the, the places where impacts occur is going to be profoundly difficult. And at the same time, you know, the, those changes are going to be occurring against both the natural backdrop, against the backdrop of natural climate variation and against the backdrop of climate change. And I think this for CL is one of our profound concerns with these technologies and one of the issues that is being really under addressed in the discussions of them. Um, CL has worked for decades representing communities that have been affected by large scale development projects where the decisions driving those projects were taken thousands of miles away. And the communities had no knowledge of the community of the projects until trucks started rolling in, into town. And then the onus fell on them to figure out where the trucks were coming from, who was paying for the trucks and what, what funding source was behind it and then proving that they were the victims of a harm. Um, in the geoengineering context, this is profoundly important because what we're seeing is the shifting of that burden of proof um, in, in these testing contexts, away from the pro pro proponents of the technologies and the proponents of the testing, to the people like the, like the, like the Sami Council, who are particularly, particularly threatened by it. And so I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, one key takeaway from Kate and Philippe's work and one key takeaway from this call should be that, you know, we need to focus on leveraging the tools that we have to addressing these technologies now. And until we have, you know, until we have a, a more comprehensive framework, the, the best way to approach this, these technologies is through an outright moratorium. The last thing that I want to say, and this is speaking as a lawyer who's worked in worked and researched in this field for a quarter century, is that there is, and I, I think it's important to call this out. There is a fundamental naivety in arguing that we should move forward with geoengineering testing, geoengineering deployment, and rely on the establishment of a global governance framework. One of the deep ironies of this is it's premised on the idea that after more than a quarter century, the UNFCCC itself has failed to deliver and has failed to be effective. And then the Kyoto Protocol, failed to deliver and failed to be effective. And then the Paris Agreement has proven you know, to have a profound lack of ambition. And against that backdrop, to argue that then the solution is to develop a new global governance framework that will include a complex regulatory system, effective monitoring for technologies that can be cheaply deployed even by private actors, and in the context in which many powerful governments want no part of that framework, even when they're advocating the technology, strikes me as profoundly naive. And I think we saw an early, we, we saw an early indicator of that um, at the last UNEA conference in which Switzerland brought forward a resolution, you know, seeking to establish some sort of, uh, seeking to adopt a resolution towards a governance process on geoengineering. And the states that sunk that resolution were the United States and Saudi Arabia, both of whom, and particularly the US, have been active state sponsors of geoengineering research. Um, and I think this is really fundamentally important. And for those who would argue, well, we're under a different administration in the United States, states now, and so things have fundamentally changed, I would ask them to look back at the last 40 years of multilateral environmental agreement development and look at how many of those treaties the US is actually actively a part of. And then look at the recent history of human rights treaties and ask the same question. And so banking on proceeding with these technologies under the assumption that an effective global regulatory governance framework for them can be developed, implemented, monitored, and effectively enforced is I think not 
the best way to proceed. And I'll pause there. Thanks very much, Carol, for that um, comprehensive discussion of the ramifications of the opinion and the broader context for the issues that we're discussing. I'm now going to move um, on to our final speaker, Asa Larson, who I introduced at the beginning. Um, Asa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for having me in this very in interesting discussion. Um, I work at the Sami Council and we're an NGO uh, representing Sami uh, local organizations from all four countries where the Sami people resides. The Sami, we are a people divided by four state borders. So we live in the north of Sweden, Finland, Norway, and uh, Kola Peninsula on the Russian side. And Sami Council, we are engaged in uh, international processes uh, as a link and a forum for our member organizations to the international arena. So we are engaged both uh, under the, the CBD uh, and also the uh, Climate Convention. And there are, uh, at those arenas, we have, of course, come across this topic of solar geoengineering in the past. Uh, but the reason why we have now engaged in this issue, it was because it was brought to us in SAPMI. Uh, we were, uh, we were, um, it was brought to our attention that uh, it was planned uh, testing of, uh, of uh, parts that, and experiments that could be linked to, so the scope project and the solar geoengineering testing of this technology. And we had quite a, a steep learning curve. Uh, we were in, uh, this was brought to our attention uh, last February and the testing was supposed to happen in, in July, June, July, summer. So it was not, not much time. Uh, but I have to say that when we realized what this um, Scopex project and the solar geoengineering technology aims to do, we reacted quite, uh, quite uh, directly and instinctively. Because the, the, the idea of solar geoengineering, it goes against uh, what we see as respectful to, towards more mother nature. And, uh, and um, it goes against what we believe would be the steps forward in, uh, in combating climate change and also to uh, once again uh, be able to uh, live in a more sustainable way and with respect to nature and to our surroundings. So what we did was that we have sent letters together with allies, environmental organizations, both to Scopex and to the uh, to Harvard, and we have also addressed the Swedish government. And um, it is true what the previous speaker, what Carol uh, said, that uh, of course the Sami people will all also be impacted uh, if and when and uh, any of this technology would be used. But I wouldn't say that we are engaged in this issue because we would be especially impacted. We are quite the opposite, uh, engaged in this issue because we see this as a common issue. We see this as an issue where everyone would be impacted. This is a question for the global community. This is a question for all of us. And that is why also it was natural for us to also raise our voice, to, st to state very clearly what our position is, because this is also our issue. Um, it is true that, um, that we see all over the globe, not, on, not only for the Sami people, but for indigenous sisters and brothers all, all around the world, that uh, the indigenous rights are not respected and the uh, principle of free pride and informed consent, FPIC, is not upholded, and so not uh, in Sweden, uh, and it was not in this, 
in this case of this project. Um, but uh, it, is, it is in line with these rights. It is also natural for us to take our natural place in the global discussion on these very important issues on how to combat climate change and how to, um, to um, design and to develop uh, our common future where the indigenous peoples have a natural place. And also because we are uh, already so engaged in environmental issues and climate change issues, because this is core of our culture and our lives, as should be for everyone, I believe. But as indigenous peoples, um, so connected to our, our territories, our lands, our waters, and our traditional livelihoods are still dependent on uh, the everyday weather and wind um, for our everyday uh, activities. Uh, we do feel it uh, even closer to uh, our hearts, I believe, uh, since we are in the front line of climate change and we see it and we uh, also we know that being an Arctic people, uh, climate change are uh, happening much more rapidly in, in the Arctic. But I do believe that this is a, a common issue and it is an issue for, for the global community. And that is also something that we have raised in our concerns about this, that this is not uh, discussed and it is not decided. And I believe that um, many have asked me about if we do not see the, um, the possibilities in research and that research should, uh, should identify these gaps and possible ways forward. And yes, I do believe that research should do that. They should point us to possible ways forward but research should also be debated and it should be transparent in the way um, of discussing. And that's, this is the, that's the role of, uh, of the global community of politicians and in decision makers and, and civil society and grassroots about what a, which of these uh, possible ways forward should we exploit? And we have said very, very clearly that uh, solar geoengineering technologies is not, it's not a part of our chosen future. And that is why we have engaged ourselves in this uh, issue and why we see that it is important uh, to raise our voices uh, because we do not um, believe that this technolo technology should be uh, developed without a global consensus and the discussion is not even uh, ongoing as we see it in the global community on the level that it should and we will be very specific uh, and clear in our position when the discussion comes up that we do not see that this is respectful towards uh, towards nature and mother mother earth we see it and i see it more as a detour actually, from the discussion that we should have about the climate action that we need to take uh, in order to, uh, to um, excuse me, in order to, uh, to lower the CO2 emissions and to actually take action that will, uh, that will, um, bring us toward a more sustainable future and not uh, go forward with a mindset that has actually put us in the climate crisis in the first place. So um, with that, I think that I will uh, stop there and I hope that you have got, uh, gotten an idea of, uh, of the Summit Council work and our position in this. And I'm looking forward to any questions? Thank you so much, Asa, for bringing this discussion to life with your with the real life explanation of how this is this is impacting on the ground.
And thank you to all our speakers so far. Now going to um, open up the floor for questions. Uh, Kate has said that she had concluded her presentation before she lost her connection and is happy to move to um, questions. So uh, while we're waiting for people to um, type in their questions, um, I also want to flag that in the chat, Lily has put in a number of um, links to documents and recordings and so on that might be useful. Um, and I'm just looking at what the comments, there's yeah, various comments about um, activities that are taking place. There's a comment from Noah that in Denmark, the government has decided to fund research in carbon capture and storage and about the um, fact the way that it's making its way into the, the discourse. Um, and I think that there's some more papers from Lily. But if anyone has any questions or reflections, having heard from the presenters, we've got some good period of time now to be able to um, discuss them. Any points of clarification, anything you were unsure about? Great opportunity having these experts on the panel. have anything okay so there is a analysis from carol in response to this question there was a comment about mitigation a bit earlier on i remember seeing um comment saying that mitigation term mitigation has been redefined meaning that mitigation of climate change in IPCC language does include CDR. That was a comment we had from the panel. Anyone, if we're not, we don't have questions so far, does any, any of the panel members having heard the others want to, to come back on anything that they've heard or, or reflect on anything? I appreciate it was a bit difficult because there were internet um, difficulties part way through, so you may not have heard all of each other. But I, okay. I could make one um, follow up comment. Just, I think I was finishing on the area of um, looking at climate finance, and I think this is an area that will come under increasing scrutiny. Is already coming under increasing scrutiny um, as a, as a goal of the Paris Agreement. Originally, or up till now, there's been a lot of focus on climate finance, doing the good things, the green energy, um, renewables and so on, and people talking about how much money is being spent on that. But the other half of the equation, which is just as important, is what money is still being spent on fossil fuels. Uh, and that's coming under um, scrutiny, including um, there's going to be a case in the UK that I'm involved in looking at export credits for a, for a liquefied um, natural gas project but i think alongside that is the question of what finance and investment is spent or to be spent on geoengineering so i think that's another part of the equation looking at finance and investment uh, and i think this is an area that we we might we may see more focus on because if money is going on geoengineering technology or r d it's not going on green energy and it's not going on just transition away from fossil fuels. So I would just, that was the only other thing I would probably add that I think that is a very important focus. And on the, on the definition of mitigation, again, I think it's important to look at what's going on in the different fora, including the UNFCCC. You know, are decisions going to be put forward that are interpretive in some way in all the different strands of work, sometimes in the very technical work that's done in working groups and so on which would accommodate geoengineering or would flag up the risks associated with it and the caution that's been expressed by the IPCC. So I think it's important to keep up with every strand of work where this, uh, these, these technologies are relevant or, or being considered. And as others have said, there are some 
distinctions in types of risks and so on. But I think everything uh, needs to be monitored very carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. In the meantime, I see we've got some questions from Lily and Steve, and also that Asa has her hands up. Um, Asa, I'll go to you first, I think, because I can also pose a question that, that was being asked, which is, um, have you had any reaction from Harvard to the letter that you sent with other Indigenous groups to shut down the Scopex, Scopex project? And what are your next steps in that campaign? Yeah, I just I can start with a comment on what was said just earlier about Kath, uh, from Catherine, and I think that is very important what you say about the finance, because that is also something that we have raised that we see this as a detour from and taking up resources and focus from what we should be doing, and and uh, as you say, it's very very. Uh, important to also follow the money and see not only what we can, uh, what resources we can gain for uh, for for the working towards more sustainable society, but also what kind of money are put in other directions that could be, in in my opinion, more well spent. So uh, I think also in that aspect, this is uh, as we see it as a a detour, taking resources and focus from, from uh, the climate action that, that has been called for for so long now. Um, uh, so I think that's very, a very, very important point to raise. Um, to the question, we have not uh, received any, any reply, any formal response from Harwood uh, yet, I could say, uh, being uh, showing a bit optimism on that. Uh, but I think that it was a very uh, important letter to because it was signed by so many brothers and sisters uh, around the world that we could show that this is not, as I said earlier, this is not a, uh, an issue for, uh, for the Sami people. It's not only an issue for the Arctic and it's not an, an issue for, for the local communities. Um, around uh, Giron, Kiruna, where the tests, uh, Scopex tests uh, were planned this summer. This is um, a much broader uh, issue and this is a global issue and, and this is a common issue. And we also have a common position, uh, all of these indigenous organizations and representatives that signed this letter. Thank you. Thanks, Asa. And uh, actually on the financing point, it's worth flagging that All Change International are doing a, quite a lot of work in this area and people who are interested might want to take a look at their website. Okay, so there's a question from Stephen and a question from Mathilde. Um, so Steve's question is, as we approach COP26, we expect there to be an outcome on Article 6. In Madrid, there was some discussion about texts that could be interpreted as related to geoengineering. It would be great to know from the panelists what possibility there might be for Article 6 to support geoengineering product, projects under the new mechanism expected to replace the CDM. So I'm going to pose this question to Kate, and I think there's a following question from Mathilde about um, avenues to conduct projects, which I'm going to pose to Carol. But Kate, first of all, um, your response on Article 6, please. Thank you. Um, and if Carol has any comments on this, please come in. I mean, my understanding is that there is some ambiguity about some of the language that has been put forward. I, I think it would be, ex first of all, extremely strange if that language accommodated any technology that the IPCC has itself distanced itself from, for example, SRM. That, that clearly cannot, cannot be right. But also, I mean, the, the language should as a minimum track what the IPCC has said about risks associated with specific technologies. Um, more broadly, there is still the issue of lock-in uh, that I mentioned earlier. So I think this is a very problematic area. And if there is an ambivalence about the language, I would say it needs to be clarified. I mean, some you know, this area is contested. There are some states who will take a different position, but it seems to me extremely important that Article 6 reflects um, the, the, the framework for achieving the goals laid down in the Paris Agreement that are actually there uh, in the provisions of the treaty. So I, I haven't followed this closely recently, but I would say if there is any 
ambiguity in the language. This needs to be addressed and, and flagged up. Thank you. Okay, um, Carol, any further thoughts on that? And also I'm gonna pose the question for Mathilde about the possible avenues, legal or non-legal to combat the trend of scientific projects. Um, testing litigation and also the question from Poovin about uh, litigation around some of the trials and research and including on the basis of um, FPIC or lack of consultation or rights of nature. Certainly. I mean, first, you know, I think on, on the Article 6 debate, I think there are a couple of really important pieces of context to bear in mind, even beyond the geoengineering debate. And then the first is that Article 6 has been highly contentious, largely because of its, you know, the role that offsets could play and the continued creation of markets could play in, in that mechanism. And I think there's been really intense civil society opposition to Article 6 on those grounds. And this brings me to the other really critical point, which is that can International, which is the largest, the largest collection of civil society organizations working on climate change, has called for the postponement and rescheduling of COP26 because we're operating in a context in which much of the world, not only civil society, but many countries are unlikely to be able to participate at the scale that they need to be able to participate. And so we're facing, we're facing a situation in which decisions, ostensible decisions on critical issues like Article 6 could be taken um, without, you know, not only without much of civil society in the room and in the space and able to engage, but many entire countries unable to engage effectively. And I think that speaks to the, the, the growing concern with how these processes are moving forward. I think that, you know, with respect to, you know, and I think that simply compounds the risk that, that Article 6 Will, will, be, will, will be expanded to include credits for SRM or other geoengineering technologies. And for folks who, who believe that that's a casual risk, I would again call your attention to the ISO's two-year process that would have been, you know, would have rolled right into that Article 6 strategy by, by you know, outlining methods for giving credits for radiative forcing measures. Um, on, on the question of legal and non-legal strategies, I think there are a few things to note. I, I think the approach taken by the SAMI is a model, and I think one of the things that we are seeing is that, um, you know, in, indigenous peoples and growing numbers of movements from the global south are really taking a stand against these technologies because the risks fall disproportionately on them. And I think that is the first and most effective way to engage. Um, are, there, are there legal tools? Absolutely. I think one of the things that we should be looking at is the consistency of, of government engagement on these technologies um, with the obligations under Aarhus and under Eskazu, and particularly, uh, and particularly with respect to, to um, human rights standards. And I think that's one of the things that we will be looking at much more actively. Um, with respect to Poovin's question about legal strategies, I think one of the key things to note on the CDR side is that there's going to be a big convergence between legal strategies around CDR and, and the growing reliance on CDR within corporate greenwashing campaigns and corporate campaigns to suggest that their business models are consistent with, with a 1.5 degree world when they're not. And I think the, the recent decision in the Shell case is emblematic of that. Um, the Shell, in the Shell case, the, the, you know, the Dutch court held that Shell needs to cut its emissions from its global operations and sold products nearly in half by 2030. And Shell's messaging on net zero to date has relied heavily on technologies that would not produce emission reductions until 2050 or beyond. Um, and one of the things that, that means is many of these net zero strategies are not going to become available um, for decades to come. And I think that is a really key uh, 
key thing to be looking at in holding companies and governments accountable. And the last thing that I'll say on this, and I think it's really fundamental, is so many of these strategies that are based on CDR, that are based on VEX, that are based on direct air capture, assume that the world will go beyond 1.5 and that BEX and CDR and BEX and DAX and other forms of CDR will be used to pull temperatures back down after that overshoot. And I think raising awareness of that assumption and what it means in terms of lives, what it means in terms of impacts on species and ecosystems, what it means in terms of impacts on communities is a really critical next step in this work. Thanks, Carol. Um Kate, did you want to add anything on that point? No? Okay. Um, and just a comment um, before we move on to question, some other questions from Dana saying that there's a danger relating to Article 6 that the text might refer to metrics that are internationally agreed, which would include ISO standards and that there are existing ISO documents on CCS. And I know, of course, that was an issue relating to the um, process Carol mentioned, which was looking at building another ISO standard on radiative forcing. Um, Carol, you may want to come back on that, but I, there are just a couple of other questions I wanted to flag. Um, and the first relates to the London Protocol and the fact that there is um, a possibility of including um, for more projects under the standard of, um, you know, marine geoengineering. Um, and which, which of the activities that might fall under the head of marine geoengineering should be a priority for London Protocol consideration. So um, what activities that fall under the head of marine geoengineering should be regulated by the London Protocol. Um, and then there's a second question which relates to UNEA, but perhaps let's deal with the first question first. Anyone want to offer any thoughts on that or the question about the ISO standards and CCS? Maybe if, if Kate could start on the marine geoengineering, um, then I, I can pick up from where she. I can't really take that one further because I'm not sure what the technologies are, but I think the core issue remains looking at the objectives of the protocol and what the position is on ocean fertilization, anything that poses similar risks will be treated in the same way. I think that's the, and I'm afraid I don't know technically what the other differential technologies are, but I think that the thrust of what they've already done makes it clear that if there, are, if there is uncertainty about the risks, if you're adding something to the marine environment for these climate engineering purposes and the risks are uncertain, the same set of principles will apply. Um, I'm afraid I, I can't really say more than that. Thanks, and I'll I'll pick up and I'll I'll note I'll, I'll note a, a few things on this. I mean, one of the things that has become really clear in our work is that the intersections between geoengineering technology and the marine environment and marine ecosystems are profound. And certainly, it includes technologies that are deployed on and in marine environments, but it also includes technologies that are that are employed on land or employed in the air and likely to affect the marine environment. Um, but I want to start with, you know, I think one of the technologies um, that I've seen gaining increasing traction and yet relatively little scrutiny, and that is, that is you know, on, on land, it's enhanced weatherization and mineralization. On, on the ocean, it is, it is calls for ocean alkalinization. And this, you know, this involves the dumping of large amounts of material into ocean environments um, you know on you know with the goal again of increase increasing co2 uptake and i think one of the fundamental challenges with that strategy is that doing it at any scale would require the deposit of massive extraordinary amounts of material that would have to be mined would have to be crushed would have to be transported on land and then shipped to deposit sites and deposited in the oceans. Every step in that chain has massive carbon emissions, of course, but the much more fundamental concern is that doing this at any scale, whether you're doing it on land or doing it in the ocean, would require minerals um, you know, being produced 
at roughly the scale of the existing global coal industry or many times larger than that. And proponents of these technologies largely ignore that reality until it gets to, well then, you know, how can you do this while avoiding those, those mining impacts? And the answer is almost always, well, look at this. We happen to have massive piles of industrial slag and coal combustion waste and fly ash that can be used for the same purpose. And this, I think, brings me to the real profound concerns with these technologies. Many of them come technologies of convenience for disposing of existing waste streams for, for, for longstanding industries, whether the steel industry or the coal industry. And I think it would be really valuable for the London Dumping, Dumping Convention to look at these technologies through that lens, because that's the real lens in which they would be operationalized. And the final thing that I'll say is just as in the context of ocean fertilization, um, when you're dealing with ocean alkalinization, the impacts um, from those plumes will stretch, you know, potentially thousands of miles, hundreds to thousands of miles from the de deposit sites with impacts on fisheries, with impacts on ecosystems that are really difficult to predict. Um, finally, and just very briefly on marine cloud brightening, I will note with respect to marine cloud brightening that there are two distinct categories of risks. You know, one, and again, it's received relatively little scrutiny, including from proponents, is that marine cloud brightening can result in the same sort of interference with hydrological cycles as you see with stratospheric aerosol injection. And this means that the impacts of marine cloud brightening could be felt thousands of miles away and potentially in different hemispheres, affecting rainfall patterns in the Amazon, affecting rainfall patterns in India and elsewhere. And that is a profoundly complex system to deal with. Um, and at the same time, one other thing that is, re has received very little attention, but I think is getting increased attention from the marine biodiversity community is that if you're doing marine cloud brightening by vaporizing the ocean surface and injecting that sea salt into the atmosphere, vaporizing that surface means vaporizing the neustonic communities that are at the surface of that water. And growing research has demonstrated that those neustonic communities are profoundly, are profoundly rare um, and largely unknown. And so there are whole categories of impacts that remain to be assessed. Thanks, Carol. So we're coming to the end of the session. And so I'm gonna pose the last question to all three panelists if they choose to make a response to it. And at the same time, I'd ask each of them when, if they're responding or otherwise to say they give us the, the one takeaway point. If you would like our participants to leave away with one core, core thing to remember or to bear in mind when considering this area, what would it be? But before we go to that, the question is, um, if a resolution si similar to that proposed to UNEA 4 um, was brought, which was on the, in the regulation of um, geoengineering, was brought forward to UNEA 5 or beyond, what would be the most defensible approach for civil society organizations to take and why? And I appreciate, Kate, you may not feel that you can respond to this, but, and also this may be, well, I, I think you could come, you could respond from an indigenous perspective if you, if you wished, but who would like to um, tackle that or to give their closing thoughts for our participants this, this afternoon, evening or morning, depending on where you are. I think my, I have a direct answer, but it would be the same as my takeaway point, which is that, this is an incredibly important set of issues, but actually we shouldn't really be having this conversation. We should be having a conversation about fossil fuels and also about agriculture. Those are the two main conversations. That's what the science tells us we need to address. That's as a matter of law, that's how the international legal regime was designed. We just need to get on and deliver on it. And so I think that's the starting point for talking. This is utterly important to be vigilant and to address the real world uh, deployment that is going on as, as Carol and Arza have, have addressed so effectively. And I think I agree, human rights law is also incredibly important in this area. But my starting point is that from the climate point of view, we should be talking about fossil fuels reduction, 
finance and agriculture. And we have the tools we can see from the IPCC reports and the UNEP reports and the recent IEA report that if we address those things, we can still meet those temperature goals. And that should be the starting point for any conversation where uh, geoengineering is being nudged to the foreground because it shouldn't be there, in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. We'd like yeah, to and you know, I think what I would add to that and, and build on with that is, I think that UNEA does have an important role to play in this space, but I think I think this upcoming UNEA is 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 a premature moment for UNEA to try and play that role. And the reason I say that is, UNEA should be a forum in which both governments and civil society are coming together and participating in an you know on an equal footing. Um, and from a deep level of engagement. And where we are right now is much of global civil society and, and the majority of countries are, are relatively uninformed about this technology, these technologies and the risks they pose. And that, that means that you know, the, the, the concentrated energy, the concentrated expertise um, and, and the concentrated you know, advocacy footprint is all within that still relatively small community of people who are actively advocating for the technologies. And so under those circumstances, taking, you know, taking an additional couple of years to get people and countries educated, informed and engaged on these issues is a better, uh, is a better approach. At the same, and, you know, and to emphasize you know, what Kate has said, doing that also gives countries the time to actually demonstrate the real ambition that we need to address climate through mitigation action, including accelerating the phase out of fossil fuels. I think that you know, once that is done, UNEA does have a critical role to play because its, its scope is comprehensive. I think and a UNEA approach should recognize the work that's the important work that was done by uh, CBD, recognize the work that has been done by the London Dumping Convention, recognize the work that's been done by the Montreal Protocol. Um, and building on that, you know, begin with a moratorium um, until a permanent ban can be put in place. I think the critical thing is not to cede this space to the UNFCCC because, and this is critically important, geoengineering is not simply a climate issue and it is not a climate solution. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so, a Sami perspective on these questions or a concluding, some concluding thoughts, please? Yes, first of all, I just want to thank uh, my co-speakers for so uh, many interesting and valid points. And I agree with both of you on your, uh, also uh, your final remarks. Uh, as Carol says, I too believe that um, um, and challenge that we have is that so many know so little about the risks and the of these technologies and uh, the risk is that uh, it's luring with a quick fix and i do believe as Ka as um, catherine said that what we need to talk about is the climate action and the discussions about the fossil fuels and the agriculture and the uh, what we have heard for so long, scientists, indigenous peoples, and experts all around the world saying that we need to do. And the takeaway mass message from, uh, from the indigenous perspective, from the Sami perspective, it is that this solar geoengineering, it contradicts our understanding and our experience of how we should live in respect and in harmony with nature. And this technology, it uh, comes with so many unknown risks that we cannot take uh, these risks as a global community for the sake of our future generations. And what we need is real and notable action that deals with addressing the root causes, just as has been said before me, of what the climate crisis actually is. And this solar geoengineering, it does not address these root causes. And that is uh, why we see it is important to also advocate for and turn the focus to what we, we 
uh, believe strongly should be the focus of discussion, uh, the fossil fuel and the uh, lowering of, of uh, the CO2 emissions. Thank you, Asa, and all our panelists for those um, really incisive and inf informative points in this discussion, this complex area. I can see that there's some really positive feedback in the chat for this um, talk. So thank you so much again for your time and for walking through this topic and making it really practical and relevant um, and, and explaining to um, all of our participants, whatever knowledge was previously, I think they all left now with a good good sense of this area and where to go for, for future, um, if they have future questions or need to look at uh, resources. So thanks again to um, CJF, to HBF and to CL for putting this on and to all of our participants. And with that, I will close the session. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye.